Hi, welcome back to your next video on Kierkegaard's fear and trembling. Before we get started, I want you to see if you can figure out the answer to this question. Um, can you make sense of Kierkegaard's view of Abraham? We have three classic Kierkegaardian figures, the tragic hero, the knight of resignation, and the knight of faith. Is Abraham all three of those for Kierkegaard? Is he just one or is he two of them? Uh, I wanna see if you understand Kierkegaard's view yet. So pause your videos now and try to get a good picture in your mind of what those three people are and which one of them Abraham counts as. Okay, last chance to pause your videos. All right, uh, in my opinion, the best answer is Knight of Faith and Knight of Faith alone. So Abraham is not actually a tragic hero for Kierkegaard and he's also not a Knight of Resignation. Uh, so in this video, our focus is gonna be on understanding what Kierkegaard's view of the Knight of Faith really is. And in your next reading, this is going to become even more clear because he's going to contrast the Knight of Faith even more with some of the other figures. Let's start by talking about the tragic hero. Abraham, uh, Kierkegaard has talked a little bit about tragic heroes and the ethical so far, but we're going to see more of this soon. The tragic hero, what we have in mind is classical figures like Romeo and Juliet, um, the Shakespearean drama, or the Basilurian drama, or uh, Agamemnon and Iphigenia, or Antigone and Oedipus. All of these are classic tragic figures. Why is that? Because each of these characters has a kind of competing demands on them, demands made by both their duties to their individual family members or friends, as well as duties because they have this role to society. So think of um, Romeo and Juliet, for example. They have, they've fallen in love, so they have this individual duty to each other. But at the same time, their families uh, are in conflict, and so they also have a duty, duty to their families. And these two duties, the reason this is tragedy and not a Shakespearean comedy, is because these two things are irreconcilable, and that's what makes them star-crossed lovers. Or think about Agamemnon and Iphigenia. Um, this comes from Homer's Iliad and Odyssey. This comes from the Iliad part, where the Greeks are set, setting off to make war on Troy. Uh, Agamemnon is the leader of all the Greek city-states armies, and he has a duty then to his whole Greek civilization in order to defeat the Trojans. But at the same time, the gods have so rigged it that um, he can't proceed. They can't get wind in their sails unless he sacrifices his, his daughter Iphigenia. And so he has a duty to his family. He also has a duty to Greek society. And his plight is tragic because they're irreconcilable. He chooses society uh, and sacrifices his daughter. And then the Greeks go on to win the, tra the, the Trojan War. I think in the old days, in the ancient Greek times, I think more of our sympathies were supposed to be on our social duties. These days, more and more the, in the individualistic West, I think we have more sympathy for Romeo and Juliet and, and their romantic love than we do to their warring families, really. Um, but this, that's sort of changing views about the nature of tragedy. Antigone is also a tragic figure. So her father, Oedipus, was a tragic figure in his own right. But then Antigone, um, faces this uh, duty to her father to give him a proper burial, but also a duty to the Greek society um, to, to because Oedipus was an outcast um, because of his moral transgressions, uh, to, to not give him a proper burial. That's what society demanded. And she was torn by this, and that's what makes her plight a tragic one. So the recipe for tragedy is to have these competing demands on oneself. You might think Abraham actually fits this quite nicely, because he has a duty to God and also a duty to Isaac. And the difficulty is he has to reconcile those and he ends up choose siding with God, but because he made the right decision, then he isn't punished after all. So Abraham's story really is not a, he's, he's in a tragic dilemma, but, um, but it has a happy ending. In fact, um, Kierkegaard doesn't think Abraham counts as a tragic hero. So pay attention in the next reading to what Kierkegaard says about this concept of the teleological suspension of the ethical because this is critical to his understanding of Abraham, and this is not what the, the tragic hero actually faces. The telos, this concept is the ancient Greek word for end, goal, or purpose. So if you're doing something teleologically, it means you're doing for it for a certain purpose or a certain goal. Um, see if you can get a better understanding of Abraham and the tragic hero when you read what Kierkegaard says about this. But the key thing to pay attention to is that the concept of the tragic hero has ethically sensible demands made on them. They have duties to both society and their family, and that's what makes their situation tragic. It's actually quite different for Abraham, according to Kierkegaard. Abraham thinks Kierkegaard, uh, Kierkegaard thinks Abraham's plight is deeply paradoxical 
because he doesn't actually fit this recipe of the tragic hero. And in fact, we should be morally horrified by it um, and in ways that we're not morally horrified by the tragic hero. So the nature of the paradox and the paradoxical or absurd element of Kierkegaard's view of faith, which makes it one of these truly existential views for the first time on the, on the historical scene, uh, is, what, is what we want to try to understand. Now, let me then, let me say Kierkegaard's view of faith and the night of faith. This is the main task for the, this video. And it has a key relationship to the other character, the night of resignation. So one thing I want us to understand is how Kierkegaard says that there's this double movement. In order to become a knight of faith, you have to first be resigned and become a knight of resignation. And then you make the second movement to the knight of faith. And that's why it's really easy to think that the knight of resignation is something Kierkegaard really praises or holds in the highest esteem. Whereas really, there's, the knight of resignation is deeply problematic for Kierkegaard. And it's only the knight of faith who is the truly exemplary individual for him. Um, so, so let's say something about how the ethical fits into this picture, and then I'll talk more about these two characters. In some sense, what, what Kierkegaard thinks we have to truly appreciate uh, is that there is something morally atrocious about what Abraham is willing to do to Isaac. And this is what he thinks is deeply wrong about the standard Christian understanding of the parable. So that from one point of view, from the ethical point of view, that uh, what he is asked to do to Isaac is murder, period. Uh, and there's no justification for murder because mur murder is morally atrocious. It's one of these, like, it's already a colored term. Uh, it's a term that has this valence to it, this judgmental aspect to it. Um, so uh, the fact that he is willing to, to murder Isaac, but then thinks everything will be made okay, that in a sense is Abraham being resigned to the fact that he has to do this thing, this horrible thing that God has commanded. Um, so resignation is, in a sense, giving up on the temporal, Isaac as a temporal son who's going to actually live in the world. Because if Isaac is murdered, then even if God is, is doing the right thing, Isaac is going to be up in heaven, not down here on the temporal world. He's going to be in eternity and live forever, but only in that other place, in the supernatural place, not here in this temporal material place. And so there's a way in which... Uh, Abraham can be reconciled to that and accept it, and he can get the eternal significance of Isaac, but sacrifice the temporal significance of him by realizing the fact that he is um, going to kill Isaac and take him out of the temporal world. Now, but what's interesting for Kierkegaard is this is actually a step that the Knight of Faith goes through, but the Knight of Faith has to keep going further beyond the resignation. But you can't really understand Kierkegaard's view of faith unless you realize that for the night of faith, you do have a kind of eternal significance to the world. So this infinite resignation, this talk about infinity and eternity, these are key Kierkegaardian terms, and they, they're associated with this middle character, the character of the night of resignation. And you have to, this is sort of the last stage before faith. So, so it's, a, it's, a, it's the path, it's the road to faith, although most people stop at this and they don't actually get all the way to faith. So what does the further step to the night of faith require? Well, the second thing to realize about Kierkegaard's view, so the first thing is the night of resignation is a step along the way to faith, but it's not actually Kierkegaard's example of what faith is. The second thing to realize is faith for Kierkegaard is deeply paradoxical, or he even uses the word, it's absurd. There's something incoherent or absurd about it that doesn't make sense. It transcends our understanding. And this goes back to those themes that we set up at the very beginning of our engagement with Kierkegaard about the limits of our understanding and the limits of communication. So Kierkegaard says, uh, you have to have paradoxical and humble courage in order to actually um, set out on the road to uh, and become one of faith. Uh, Notice, notice this reference to temporality too. So that's why I say in the previous slide, you have to recover the world and temporality. So the key, Kierkegaard even says this, the key to faith is actually a return to the temporal while having the eternal at the same time. That is the paradox, that you can both have the temporal and the eternal simultaneously. You can hold together two things which are, which are opposites, which, which aren't reconcilable, which fundamentally don't make sense. Um, so look, look in the text. He, he continuously talks about the paradox that constitutes faith and that it's a monstrous paradox. There's, it's not like, it's not a happy go lucky paradox. The life of Abraham, Kierkegaard wants us to realize this is, is a life of 
of difficulty. It's, it, there's something horrific about it. There's something we don't want to emulate about it and don't want to wish this necessarily for ourselves. So the night of fate, it's paradoxical, and we can understand the paradox by understanding how it keep, requires us to keep two things together, which really don't make sense together. The temporal and the, and the eternal, or the finite and the infinite, or you could just consider it like the temporal and the infinite. Um, so how do these come together for the night of faith? Well, first, the night of faith goes through the stage of resignation, and they get a kind of in, infinite significance to their lives. And what I think is going on here in Kierkegaard is in order to have a, to be a night of resignation, you must have a, a life-defining commitment to something. The whole of your life is given significance by some kind of cause, purpose, or commitment, some kind of telos that, um, that he's going to talk about. And it's this unconditional commitment that is guiding you as a night of resignation. So that's how you get infinity. That's how you secure eternity and infinity. Um, so when Kierkegaard says stuff like you have to, the night of this night, the night then, he's talking about the night of resignation here, uh, can concentrate his whole life's content on the meaning and reality of a single thing. You have an in, indivisible purpose to your life. That's what gets you the infinite. But then the night of faith does this bizarre thing. After giving up, so in order to get that infinite significance, you have to sacrifice the temporal for the eternal. That's like saying everything will be made right in heaven then you have to regain the temporal in some impossible way. So it's both eternal and temporal. And that doesn't make sense. That's the paradox. So you have to have a kind of unconditional commitment to be a knight of faith, but it has to be something in the temporal world. It's like Abraham has to believe that he's going to kill Isaac, but at the same time, Isaac is not going to die. And that doesn't make sense. That is deeply paradoxical. How could Isaac actually have be in this temporal world and be what Isaac is supposed to be for Abraham? while at the same time having the eternal significance. Um, that is the thing that, that ultimately is difficult to understand about Kierkegaard's view. But, this, but there's an amazing picture of the human condition that emerges from this. Kierkegaard knows that his view is difficult to understand, and so he gives us a couple of examples to try to make more sense of it. Contrasting it with the tragic hero is one thing, and we're going to see that more in the next reading. In this reading, the key part that I want to focus on is Kierkegaard's concept of love and unconditional love as being an example, example uh, of being a knight of faith. So in this reading, he, has this, he talks about the story of the young lad falling in love with the princess. I think this is really one of the most illuminating things to understand what really is going on with Kierkegaard. Now, be warned, though, there's not just one univocal way of understanding the uh, unconditional love for Kierkegaard. You can be a knight of resignation or a knight of faith here. So there's multiple things going on. So <clears throat> what's interesting about this is unconditional love is where you do have this deep life-defining uh, commitment to a certain relationship where everything changes in your life because now you see yourself as a part of a pair rather than an individual. So this is no mere momentary passion. Uh, and Kierkegaard quite importantly distinguishes both the night of resignation and the night of faith for infatuations or falling in love in an erotic sense. This is something far deeper. Like this is what's associated with, the, with what's called romantic love. Uh, so there's several ways in which Kierkegaard's choice of the word knight here is no accident. Because the example of troubadours in the medieval period and being these uh, this sort of high, high medieval troubadours romantic love is actually exactly uh, a good ex uh, uh, paradigm for what Kierkegaard has in mind. So these, these knights, these, these medieval knights would pledge their love and allegiance to a lady. Now she was going to like marry the king. She was married to the king or was going to marry a prince or something. She was never going to marry the knights, but the knights followed this, their liege in this un completely unconditional way. And they would even sort of love the, the queen or the lady. But it wasn't like a, a kind of love in competition with the king. It was like an eternal love. They almost in some ways deified her and gave her a kind of eternal significance where they would lay down their life for her. And that's how they, that's, that's how they, uh, had a certain role in society and a certain entire purpose to their lives. They were knights leading a certain kind of chivalrous life that it was completely life-defining for them. So that's ways in which um, this is a nice example for Kierkegaard. Uh, 
of course, with the troubadours, they're also associated with um, creating music and singing songs. Uh, so there's a kind of artistic dimension to this too. Um, that's interesting to think about. Um, let me say this part about transfigured, I think is really helpful and enlightening because we can think about it as a sort of love between humans, but, but when it gets this unconditional significance, it's like it gets sublimated or transfigured into an unconditional commitment. And that is this life defining thing. So I think the word transfigured here is sort of enlightening and helps us understand what's at issue. Now, so you can go through life uh, or the young lad could go through life with the his love of the princess is one of night of resignation. So if you if he does it in that sense, what does he get? Well, he gets a kind of there is a way in which he gets peace and repose. So there's something consoling about the night of resignation because he has purpose in life now and he has no uncertainty. He's not racked with existential angst because he knows what his life is all about. It's a, and he can easily sacrifice him, his life because he's doing it for honor, for the, for the thing that gives him a higher purpose. So there's something quite great about it. There's also another way in which we can understand this talk about peace and repose. And this is the sense in which eternal significance really requires a sacrifice of the temporal. Think about, and again, how the Night of Resignation can be metaphorically understood as a, as a metaphor for the process of grief. Like, if Abraham really does lose Isaac, he can console himself by saying, well, at least Isaac is now with God, and that's what God must have wanted by giving this command, and he's in a better place, and he will be there for eternity, and everything is going to be okay. Now, that might be really, that's a way of a parent going through the process of grieving for the loss of a child. And so that would be Abraham as a night of resignation if he went through with it. But nonetheless, everything was okay. It was, it was, it was sad and terrible, but it's still, there's a kind of way in which he can grieve and come to peace with himself because he's resigned himself to the eternal significance of the child being in a better place in heaven. I think some of the, this is the most moving part of the whole text in my opinion, and I think deeply insightful about grief that Kierkegaard is writing here is that this process of going through grief, of thinking that everything is okay in some sense or other, it, it is a sense in which uh, we give up, we, we are resigned to the fact that the person is no longer with us in this life, in the temporal. But, and we can, nobody else can go through this process of grief for us. Um, so this idea that it's like, it's like a shirt sewn in tears, um, and it gives you a kind of better protection than iron and steel. I think this is very poetic because going through the process of grief like this can help you get through almost anything in life. Uh, it can give you that deep protection that there is no, no other way you could have gotten through, gone through grief. But the, the most beautiful one here, and the, but the secret to life is that everybody must sell it for themselves Nobody can go through grief for you either. It is only the process that is deeply individual, and it's the way in which each of us can can figure out um, how to reconcile the hor horrific things that have happened in our lives. Now, this is again one way in which you can understand the example of romantic love, but you could also go a step further. So, there's another way of thinking about the lad in love who could actually be the knight of faith for Kierkegaard too, because this would be the the romantic love where you don't just get eternal significance, but you realize the knight is never going to actually, um, you know, have, be with the princess. They can never actually um, be a, together in this temporal life. Uh, but what if, what if he actually did think that? If, if, if he thought, okay, I have this eternal significance from my devotion to the princess, but of course she's the princess and I'm just the knight, but nevertheless, I believe I could be with her. And not in the afterlife where I'll be, I will be forever her liege, uh, or she will be forever my liege in the afterlife, so I will still be a knight even in, in heaven or in the Elysian fields or wherever I'm going. But if I could actually be with her in this life now, which, which is incoherent because of my social role and her social role, if, if the lad, if the knight actually believed that, then that would be entering the realm of the paradoxical, where they would get eternal significance, but then they would somehow impossibly believe that it could happen now in the temporal. That would be the example of the paradoxical night of faith. So you both first get the unconditional commitment, the life-defining meaning, and yet you still, 
and that gets you, but that only makes sense in the eternal or the infinite, but then you still bring it back to the finite and believe that the infinite is possible now or the eternal is possible in time. That gets you into the realm of the night of faith. So there's a way of thinking about that example for Kierkegaard. Now, this is Kierkegaard's example of the highest possible form of life. This is what I want you to think about, how to really see if you understand the view. Who or what is absent from this? I mean, pause, pause the videos for a second and try to contemplate this for me. What do you think about this story? Okay, that was your last chance to pause the videos. Um, here's what's absent for it. Where's Jesus? This is supposed to be a Christian conception of the highest possible form of life. So, but if this is a Christian one, it was supposed to be Jesus who was the only way in which one could be fully reconciled to God um, according to the New Testament and according to you know, Kierkegaard's Protestantism. So this is, this is a very unusual, this is a, a, an incredibly idiosyncratic, iconoclastic version of Christianity that we're getting. And in fact, in some ways, I think we can understand this in purely atheistic terms, but I'll talk about that in previous videos. But in some, think about it like this, when your, your unconditional commitment to an individual, like the, the knight to the princess or the parent to the child, uh, something that gives your life all defining purpose or or an individual to a social so social cause or something uh, then in some ways if jesus is sort of the symbol for what can redeem us in our lives then any of those things could be jesus for us they have the same function or you know that re life redeeming function that all defining purpose so in some ways, sort of the role that Jesus plays in Christianity for Kierkegaard is a symbolic role, and that role can be fulfilled, or it gets particularized for us in Kierkegaard's view of faith that has this highly temporal dimension by our life-defining commitment to one of these causes or purposes or individuals or other. Um, so I just want you to think about how unusual the view is if, to, to make sure you fully understand it. Okay, so what we've been talking about in this video is Kierkegaard's view of the night of faith, and that is his highest form of life. That is his exemplary individual or the most authentic way we can live, the most um, laudatory way a human could be. Okay, thanks.